Good evening, everyone. We're back. I hope you missed my jokes. <laughs> because you're about to get another one. And in honor of Aaron, I have a plant joke. So, Dr. Aaron, are you ready for a plant joke? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Who is it? All right, you two. Uh, the joke is, <laughs> I'm sorry. Here's the joke. Why do plants hate math? Yeah. Any clues, audience? Any any sage words? <laughs> oh no, not with the puns already. <laughs> um, Jonathan says um, they synthesize it. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, oh, Jason. You got it. So the answer is because it gives them square roots. Oh. <laughs> oh, so bad. So bad. <laughs> All right. For those of you who are attending for the first time, sorry, I started with a really bad joke. Hope, hope you return <laughs> at some later time. But <laughs> for those of you who are returning members of our audience, Thank you so much for returning after our short two week break. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McLean and I will see you guys at the end of Aaron's talk. Before you go, Bert, I need to know, do you have like a giant joke book or do you have like multiple small joke books for different topics? It's interesting um, and I don't, hmm, I don't really want to give away my secret, but my secret really Fair is enough. Google. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I just now I'm envisioning you spending hours Googling like the perfect plant joke or algae joke for time. No, it's five minutes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mert. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope I find you and your family and friends safe and in good health this evening. I'm Craig McLean. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, AKA LUMCON. And I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for LUMCON's online science series. Every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central, we're inviting Louisiana scientists to share their research. And we'll give you the opportunity at the end uh, to ask questions of some truly amazing scientists doing some truly extraordinary science. And I hope you will continue to join us each and every week as we explore more of the world from the comfort of our homes. And you can find more information about the complete series at our website, LUMCON.ee. .edu. You just scroll down on the home page and you'll find a link under the news and events there. And it will actually even take you out to links uh, from all the previous talks as well. And if you'd like to like this online content, there's a nice big fat donate button at the top of our web page in which I'd encourage you to make a donation to help us continue to bring this online content to you. Well, tonight is my privilege to introduce Dr. Erin Cox. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of New Orleans. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Hawaii, where she studied seaweeds and animals along the shore there. Uh, before coming to UNO, she did a postdoc in the south of France. Uh, that sounds tough. And a postdoc also at Dolphin Island Sea Lab in Alabama, um, a beautiful marine lab there. Uh, her laboratory group uh, focuses now on the ecology of animals and plants that live along the shallow seafloor uh, sea with a focus on plant interactions with altered environments. And Aaron, very much looking forward to your talk tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope you guys uh, find this interesting, as interesting as I do. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, seeing through the eyes of a marine botanist. So I study as a scientist these underwater plants, and I mostly focus on algae um, and seagrasses. And this picture I took last week, I, I really love it. It shows both, I took it at Lake Pontchartrain, and it shows both grasses and then that fuzzy stuff on top of the grass um, as algae. Um, and I call both of these, these groups, let's see, my slides advance. Um, <laughs> I call both of these groups marine plants, and I use marine plants really broadly to mean any organism living in the seawater that harvests light energy for its food. So these 
algae and seagrasses, they um, have pigments in them that will harvest that light energy and that's how they are sustained. Um, and I think that um, algae get this bad rap, uh, maybe not so much seagrasses, but algae, like whenever I have students that take a marine botany class with me, they tell me, you know, when a slimy algae touches my foot in the water, I freak out, I really don't like it. And I hope to convince you that algae are more than slimy, icky scum. And some of you have also might have uh, have experience with algae in, and not know it if you go down to rock jetties or maybe to and climb on rock jetties by the water um, or have gone to a boat launch ramp and you see something green or you feel slick and it, it's slippery. This is likely to be algal mats um, that make the rocks slippery. But algae is so much more than that. Um, and seagrasses are so much more than that. This is how I, uh, when I say the word algae, this is what I envision. And th these are the different types of diversity and different kinds of algae. And you can see that they have um, brightly different colors, different shapes, different sizes. And uh, this coloration that you see on this slide, this uh, red, brown, and green coloration um, and hues of those colorations are due to those pigments and they have different kinds of pigments, but all the pigments are going to help in capturing that light energy. And all plants need light. Uh, they need light for that energy. They need nutrients. And they also need to be able to uptake carbon dioxide and turn that carbon dioxide, that carbon in there into their growth. And so we'll see different colors. Uh, you can also see that algae is, has different shapes and morphologies. And they also have different textures. So this alga that's in the far corner, it's kind of pink uh, and sprawly. Um, let's see if I can put my um, pointer on it. So right there, that one will feel like spaghetti. If you taste, touched it and picked it up, it'd feel like really wet, snotty spaghetti. And then other algae, you could touch like this one here in the middle that's pink and um, it's actually hard and it, it looks pink. It's actually a red algae, but it looks pink because it has calcium in its surface. We call it a calcifier and it has calcium carbonate in the tissues of the plant. And so it feels very hard and actually grows like cement on the rock. Um, so algae do all kinds of things, all different sizes, different shapes, different textures. And just to show you the types of ranges of sizes of algae, um, I, I have this slide. And this slide, I pulled a, a figure from a paper that's showing the, the range of size in microscopic algae. So algae um, is in the water, it's on rocks, it's on plants, um, it's all around in the water. And the si we can't see that with our eyes, we have to use a microscope or some sort of imaging to be able to see them. Yet they have such a variation in size that if you put it onto the scale of something we're more for familiar with, the size ranges ranges from a fish all the way to the size of, the, of Manhattan in terms of how different their sizes are in microalgae. So that's pretty amazing in its itself. But then we also have macroalgae and macroalgae can be a few centimeters like this um, Portland algae here, or it can be several feet tall like the giant kelp here and, and form these large forests. And so the algae, that we see at the beach and with our eyes, we usually refer to as seaweeds. Um, and what's even more cool about algae is that they form these close relationships with animals. So you may have heard about corals and uh, that's this middle picture here. So corals harbor an alga that lives inside them. It's a dinoflagellate and it photosynthesizes and it, it shares some of that energy with, uh, with the coral. And this helps the coral to grow and maintain its, its, its coral skeleton. But algae also can be found in things like giant clams. So here's a giant clam at the bottom. So giant clams are about the size of me. And I'm about, I'm about five foot tall, so they can be really big. And then the, um, they have two shells and they remain open. And they remain open during the day so that, that this uh, bright colored tissue that they have as part of their body there, that bright blue color, it's filled with algae. And that algae is gonna photosynthesize and help the, the clam to grow. And this story, this one's my favorite in the corner. Uh, this is a jellyfish. 
it's in the um, island nation of Palau, and this jellyfish no longer stings. It's lost its ability to sting, and it harbors inside of it uh, an algae, and that algae will photosynthesize for and share its energy with the jellyfish. And the jellyfish will actually migrate across uh, these tidally enclosed lakes um, from sunrise to sunset following the sun in order to maximize that light harvest. And if that wasn't cool, <laughs> then you probably will like this uh, marine, marine snail. So it's like, this is a marine mollusk. It's, it's lost its um, shell. So it's, a, it's never had a shell. It's, it's a type of marine mollusk that doesn't have a shell on its back. Um, and what it does is it, it will feed on algae, but it will steal the algae's uh, light harvesting apparatus and put it in its back. So now it can feed, uh, but it can also photosynthesize. And so algae do some really cool things um, and they're very important, but so are seagrasses. So seagrasses um, don't have the type of diversity in form or in coloration that algae do. So you can see here, um, seagrasses are green or are hues of green. And that's because the type of pigments that they have to harvest light are the same as land plants and green algae. It's these chlorophylls, and they're, they're missing those other pigments that the red and the brown algae have. So that is why they appear green. Uh, when we see seagrasses here in the northern Gulf of Mexico, they're often up against the marshes, like in this top photo, um, right up there in the middle, uh, that, those dark spots and the water, the dark shadows, those are actually uh, grass beds. Um, so seagrasses are a little different than algae because their nearest um, and most recent relative was a land plant. So they're, they're kind of in between a land plant and an algae in terms of the characteristics that they have. When we think of a land plant, you think of roots <laughs> and you think of stems and trunks and leaves. Um, and a lot of that structure, or a lot of that part, a lot of parts of the plant are to give it structure and air. And in water, these plants don't need that type of structure. But they still need to photosynthesize and to photosynthesize and get that light energy and to get that carbon dioxide. Um, they need, well, to get the carbon dioxide, they need, if you're a land plant, you have to have these pores where it takes up CO2. But the seagrasses and the algae, they don't have those pores. Instead, their whole um, body that's exposed to the water photosynthesizes and takes up that, um, that CO2 directly from the water. Um, but what, what seagrasses have that algae don't, is seagrasses actually will reproduce with uh, flower. So you, you can see on this far side that they produce flower and they produce pollen and they'll actually, um, from that, form a seed and the seed will turn into a new seagrass. And seagrasses also have roots. So algae don't have roots, but seagrasses do. And you can see this, the roots in this image. Um, another thing that's really different about algae and seagrasses is where they live. You can find algae living in almost every environment. Um, algae live in polar regions and they can live in ice, like in this bottom picture, the, the orangey coloration, a lot of that is from the algae that live inside the ice. Um, algae can live uh, suspended in the water column or as big floating mats on top of the, of the water. And we see this um, here in the northern Gulf of Mexico. We have these big sargasm mats, the brown algae that will spend its entire life in the water. And it often um, it will float up onto the beach and you can see it as beach rack if you walk around the beach along the coast. Um, and then this picture, this bottom picture with all these red algae, this picture is of the deep sea at 225 feet. It's actually a photograph that I took from a, another Louisiana researcher who studies these deep water alga um, or deep water algae. And you can see that even at 225 feet, you can find algae. Uh, seagrasses, on the other hand, they have a really narrow range of environments that they can live in. Uh, they do live in the temperates and they, they live in also the top tropics, but uh, they tend to be found only in sandy, soft sediments, and they need to be in the shallow waters where there's a lot of light. And they also need slow water flows. If, if water flow is too strong, 
then they will um, be pulled out of the sediment and they, they won't survive. So why should you care about them? Um, you should care about them because they are food and refuge for a lot of organisms that we as humans depend upon or we as humans uh, find affinity to, like sea turtles eat sea grasses, uh, dugongs and manatees eat sea grasses, some geese and, and uh, ducks eat sea grasses, and then the um, algae as well. Many things live around um, algae or feed on algae. And then uh, things like crabs and shrimp will also live in seagrass beds. So it's food and refuge for a variety of organisms. And it, we also, um, as humans, we, we extract things from algae that we use and products that we eat. Um, so there's inside algae that there's a, we can use the algae to produce something called carrageenan. It's like a thickening agent. Uh, for a lot of our, our food. So you can find carrageenan in ice cream and whipped cream and chocolate milk. Uh, you can also find it in toothpaste. And then uh, agar is another product that we get from, from seaweeds. And so this guy is holding up a big thing of grassalaria. This, this type of seaweed you can um, cultivate and extract agar from it. And it's used to uh, culture bacteria on plates. So we, we get uh, a petri dish and on top of that petri dish somebody pours agar. It's a thick medium uh, that when you go to the doctor and you have a bacterial, or you think you have a bacterial infection like strep, they'll use a swab, they'll swab the back of your throat and then they'll, they'll rub it and plate it on these petri dishes and that bacteria will grow on the petri dish and allow the doctor to identify what type of, of uh, bacterial infection you have. So these are important products we get from algae. And algae is even important to a lot of island cultures. So in Hawaii, a lot of people seek algae out for food or for forgiveness ceremonies. So th and they refer to algae as limu. And this is an example of that. This is limu kohu. It's a Sparagopsis taxiformis. It's a red algae. And if you just pulled it directly off of the reef, and ate it, it could get you quite sick because it's filled with um, uh, brominated compounds. Like if you smell it, it smells like chlorine. Um, and so what the Hawaiians have learned to do is they've learned to prepare it in a way that gets rid of those brominated compounds and it's uh, highly sought after as a, a, a food item. And if you've gone to a sushi restaurant um, or made sushi at home, then you have eaten a red seaweed called nori. So uh, when you wrap your rice and there's that in green and that green seaweed, that's actually a red seaweed. It's just when it dries and gets processed, it turns green. So it's a red seaweed. Uh, the scientific name for it is porphyra. Um, and it's a huge industry now. And we owe this industry to a female researcher named Kathleen Drew Baker. She figured out the life history of nori. Uh, because many algae will alternate between a macroscopic form and a microscopic form during their life cycle, uh, it was difficult to cultivate nori without knowing that the um, other part of the life stage was microscopic. And she figured it out, and it was the breakthrough that they that we that humans needed in order to send uh, sushi around the world and make sushi around the world. Uh, and this slide, uh, since I'm trying to get you to see through the eyes of a marine botanist, I'm going to share, this was a slide from my uh, PhD advisor, and she wanted, you know, trying to teach us all to be marine botanists and to see through her eyes. And she showed, showed me this and said, you, if you go up to a coral biologist and you ask, is this a healthy reef and what's in this reef? They're gonna say, it's corals and it is a healthy reef. But in fact, if you look at it with new eyes, you'll see that this reef is, even though it's a healthy reef, it's dominated by algae. There's algae in the tissue of all of these corals. And then if you highlight the rest of the algae, um, you can see that the whole reef is actually dominated by algae. All of this area that I've colored in or that she's colored in as uh, green, 
is a, an alga called Crustus coralline algae. It's that pink one I showed you in the very beginning that has cements itself to the rock or to hard surfaces. It's doing the same thing here for this reef. It's cementing itself to the rock or to the coral, and it's making this coral be very wave resistant and able to um, have new corals settle and for it to grow very tall. And so algae play an important role even in, in healthy environments. And we tend to forget that because, well, we'll get to that. We tend to forget that because there are some times when algae can take over and, and be quite negative. So when I came to Hawaii and learned about marine algae with my PhD advisor, um, I started having to figure out my own research projects and see the, see the marine botany through my own eyes. And I was coming from a temperate system where algae is really hard to ignore. You, if you went to the beach, uh, there's this huge area where the tides cover the shore during part of the day and they expose, um, they expose the shore for the other part of the day and it's covered with this huge biomass of algae. But in Hawaii, when you get to the shore, it's a really narrow intertidal zone um, because we have really small tidal change. And then the algae there is really, really diminutive and small. So you can walk right past it, and most people do because they want to go see the coral, they want to go see the fishes, uh, they want to swim in the water. But this algae is really uh, important and it's really diverse here. There's actually 400, in Hawaii, there's 400 species of red algae alone. So I was interested in how do algae that live on the shore, that are supposed to be underwater, like because they have marine ancestry, how do they live in this hot tropical environment with high light and high temperature? And what I was able to do was see differently. I was able to take this infrared camera and I was able to take pictures of algae when they were exposed to air on the low tide, when the tide was out. And what I found was that algae are engineering their own environments and that's how they're able to to live in these different places so for instance this alga is called liagra and the infrared pictures on the one side and then the normal pictures on the other so this is liagra it's a red algae it was during low tides it's living on this really uh, bare black rock so that rock is heating in the sun to about 30 degrees that's close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but the algae is able to stay two degrees cooler. And we think it's able to stay two degrees cooler because it's occurring in these clumps and those clumps are holding water. And then it's got that calcified, that calcium in its surface. And that calcium in its first surface is giving it that pink and white color and that's reflecting light. So it's reflecting light, holding water and it's able to stay cooler. And algae are great at engineering their own environments and because of this, uh, they're changing the, the environment around it and making it more conducive for other organisms to live there and also providing us some benefits. And this is easy to see in a kelp forest. So if you go into, if you've ever seen a kelp forest, or if you're lucky enough to, to go into a kelp forest, there's a um, huge, huge forest, right? Like on the bottom, you have a hold fast, and on the top, you have this canopy. And the canopy can get these really big, thick mats. And if you dive down below the canopy, it gets very dark and it's really unsettling. It gets dark quickly. And so the algae is actually changing the light. And so the, the darker light at the bottom is more conducive for some other algae that prefer dark light to live there. And it's, um, the plant itself is also slowing water, water. And that's easy to see if a big wave came in that wave would have to move through this whole forest. Um, and the algae help to slow that water movement down. And they're also photosynthesizing. So if you have this huge forest that's underwater, it's photosynthesizing, it's taking up the CO2. So it's changing the water chemistry by taking up that CO2. And whenever it's um, uh, uh, using the pigments to harvest light, and, so, and taking up that CO2, it's also producing oxygen. So the plant is reducing the CO2 and oxygenating the water during, um, during the day. And then at night, there's no photosynthesis going on at night and you have all of these animals around and you also have the plant there. And so what animals and plants do is we respire. And we, we know this, right? Because we breathe in, we breathe out, we're taking up oxygen, that's respiring. 
So at night, when there's not any photosynthesis going on, uh, the oxygen can get quite low. So plants are changing their environment, and this is on a big macro scale for kelp forests. And what I found, um, and what researchers have found in Hawaii is that um, on tropical shores, even like little micro scale on these smaller diminutive algae, they're also changing the environment just on a much smaller level. So this is an alga in the corner here, the yellow one here. This alga is called Anfeltiopsis, and a researcher named Kevin Beach, who was in my lab uh, before I got there, he found out that what, why it was able to live on the shore and why it was so bright yellow has to do with its ability to um, protect itself. So these, these tips of these, this alga um, are bright yellow, and that bright yellow is actually this pigment called a carotenoid, and it's, um, its job is to, to uh, get rid of too much sunlight because too much sunlight like UV can damage the um, light harvesting pigments. So it's sacrificing the tips of this plant and the tips of the plant are making like an umbrella to protect the inside of the plant. Right at the rocks, you can kind of see that it's reddish in color. Uh, that reddish color is where all the photosynthesis and the light harvesting is happening. And it's able to do that because of those um, yellow umbrellas, and then the tip of it is drying, but the base of it is staying really wet. And if you open this alga up, you can see that there's small crustaceans living inside, um, inside it, inside and around the branches as well. And seagrasses, um, I can't forget seagrasses. So seagrasses to um, the northern Gulf of Mexico are also really important, especially um, along our coast, because what seagrasses do is they have these roots that go into the sediment and they're gonna keep the sediment there. They're gonna stabilize the sediment. And then their leaves go up into the water column. So the leaves are going to slow that water flow. And so what the um, plant does for us here in Louisiana and in um, other parts of the Northern Gulf of Mexico is it actually helps to prevent erosion because you're say, stabilizing sediment and you're slowing water flow. And um, all of these plants are taking up CO2 during the day and oxygenating the water during the day. And then the whole community with the plants as well are respiring and using up oxygen at night. And that's gonna be really important later in my talk. So this is why algae get a bad rap. Uh, this slide here is showing you that algae and seagrasses, their, their growth is tied to the quality of the water. So many of the algae that become a nuisance, they have really simple morphologies. So whenever the, the water condition changes and it favors them, they can grow really, really quickly and they can engineer their new, uh, many of them can engineer a new environment. And so this allows some algae to become a nuisance uh, while other algae um, may decline. And here's an example. This is a reef in, in Hawaii, Kaneohe Bay. Um, it's a picture of it. And this alga that you see that's bright yellow, this is actually Gracilaria salicornia. It was um, introduced to the bay by a researcher that wanted to see about um, using it as an aquaculture species and growing it and harvesting it. And he abandoned those efforts. And then there was this sewage outfall, which created a lot of nutrients, which allowed this, um, this al alga to take over. And it's able to grow very quickly and it covers the coral and it changes the light and it smothers them. So algae can become a nuisance, nuisance when conditions are optimal for it. If conditions aren't optimal, they may decline. And we're used to seeing this in the Gulf of Mexico with um, small microscopic plankton and, and these harmful algal blooms. Um, harmful algal blooms, um, their conditions changed, uh, extra nutrients, um, and then the alga takes off on its growth. Usually they're unicells and they split and grow pretty rapidly. Um, and they become problematic because they can be overproductive. So if you're overproductive, there's, there's too much algal mass, uh, it starts to die and decay. And when it dies and decays, there's a lot of bacteria and a lot of respiration occurring. And so the um, habitat loses its oxygen and things start to die. Um, other harmful algal blooms, um, like this dinoflagellate, this red tide here, 
they can um, harbor toxins and those toxins can be um, detrimental, particularly to marine mammals and even to humans. But um, seagrasses, uh, I, when I said that many, uh, many algae will become a nuisance and grow, where others, when you change the water quality, they decline. Well, seagrasses are a marine plant that when you change the water quality, they tend to decline, unless it's for better. <laughs> if you change the water quality um, and what they're used to, that's a problem. So this is a map, a global map, showing you where uh, people have studied seagrasses and, and looked at their abundance. And you can see each pie chart is rep representing the number of studies done in that area. And then if it's red in the pie, the red is the proportion that have reported a decline in seagrass abundance. And you can see that in the Gulf of Mexico, it's quite red. So uh, in this region where, and globally, we're seeing seagrasses decline. And why is that? It's because the water quality declined. If there's too much nutrients, you can get algal growth. If there's changes in temperature or salinity, this causes stress for the plants and can cause decline. If the light gets too low from too much sediments coming in, you can also get outbreaks of um, herbivores like these urchins that will graze, overgraze um, seagrass beds. Uh, and then you can also directly remove seagrass when you dredge or if you have a boat and you go through a really shallow seagrass bed, you can leave a boat scar from ripping it. the engine rips out all of the, the grass. And so we, we're seeing declines and we should be concerned because these uh, marine plants are, are, are providing a lot of benefits for other organisms and for, for us as humans. And so if I have time, let me see if I have time, I have a bit of time, I can share uh, some uh, research I do with marine plants. I tend to use marine plants as indicators of how um, much productivity or growth of other organisms that marine plants can support. So if the marine plants are very productive, that means that they can support um, more organisms and more growth. And so I look at marine plants as an indicator of the ecosystem and how productive it is and how it functions. And I've done a couple of studies here in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, looking at that on art once on artificial reefs and the others on seagrasses. And so artificial reefs, what we did uh, if you're unfamiliar with artificial reefs, these are just human constructed hard substrates, hard things, hard materials that we've placed in the water. So it can be oil and glass, gas platforms, it can be uh, concrete blocks, it can be a ship um, that we've sunk as humans. Um, and these things, what happens to them um, is they are colonized by other living organisms and many fishes surround them and use them for part of their life cycle. And managers, fishing managers are really interested in them because uh, gray trigger fish, red snapper and gray snapper now all rely on artificial reefs for part of their life history. Um, and uh, the other idea behind these reefs is we're, if here in the Gulf of Mexico, it's a really soft sedimenty habitat. So there's not a lot of hard habitat. So you're taking, something that's limited in supply and you're making it more available. So perhaps it's going to increase the productivity around you. It's going to increase the number of fish, increase their growth and increase um, their numbers. And so this is a quote taken from, I was focused on artificial reefs in Alabama, and this is a quote taken from uh, uh, Alabama Marine Resource, Resource Division about the benefits of um, artificial reefs that they're supposed to increase the availability of a hard bottom habitat to increase foraging opportunities, shelter, and spawning potential of fish. And I wanted to know what's the role of algae on these reefs. So algae settling on these reefs, perhaps algae is supporting these, these ecosystems. Um, and is it the main carbon source? Is it the thing that, the, that these fishes and, um, and small animals around it are going to feed upon and use? And then there's this whole debate over do these reefs just attract fish from other areas or are they actually helping to produce more fish and produce bigger fish? And so I thought maybe my research could help um, provide some evidence one way or the other. And I went to Alabama here 
uh, just off the coast and I focused all of these little red lines, the red um, outlines show where there are artificial reefs and the names of the different regions with artificial reefs. But I focused on these ones really close to shore. And the way I look at how productive an ecosystem is and how much is contributed to um, the marine plants is I take pieces of the community and I enclose them into either clear, well, in both clear and dark containers. So remember in clear containers, there's light. And so you can have photosynthesis occurring, um, but in dark containers, you can't, you only have respiration. And so um, in photosynthesis, you produce oxygen and respiration, you can consume oxygen and I can measure the oxygen at the beginning, right when I put the uh, community of animals and plants into a jar, I can measure oxygen and then I can let it close it up and let it sit for several hours and then measure oxygen again. And I can use the change of oxygen in the light and the dark to kind of come up with a budget, like an income of carbon. Um, and so I did this at the reef. I did it, um, I enclosed parts of the reef, I enclosed parts of the sediment, and I enclosed the um, water column into jars. And so parts of the water column were plankton, small microscopic organisms will be floating around called plankton. And I closed all of these things and I waited three to four hours and then I, I looked at the change of oxygen. I'm gonna show you what that looks like on a dive. Um, if I can do this here <laughs> and share it with you. Okay. And so you're going to see an eco tree, which is just a stacked uh, concrete wheels um, that have been put in the water to provide some habitat for uh, fishes. And right now you're seeing through the eyes of fish biologists that I'm forced to study <laughs> ecosystems. <laughs> so he's wearing a GoPro on his head. And this is how we took chunks off the reef to put them into our clear and uh, dark jars. And you can see the fish swimming around and all of the different organisms that are colonizing this concrete reef. fish that are swimming around, those are a couple of damsel fishes. One of them is introduced to the Gulf of Mexico. Or maybe a range expansion, I should say a range expansion into the Gulf of Mexico, northern Gulf of Mexico. Do you see he puts, uh, the divers putting those chunks onto these platforms, which are the lids, and then they're being enclosed with a clear or dark jar. And you get animals and plants when you do this. All right, so hopefully we're back. Um, and so this is the results of that. And don't get afraid, uh, if you just did your taxes, you're really gonna understand this um, because I'm gonna use an analogy of, of your taxes. So it's a simple graph. Uh, what, what we have here is we're measuring production and we're measuring productivity as and oxygen, the change of oxygen per hour. So it's a rate, change of oxygen per hour. And then we can translate that oxygen through, through a calculation into carbon. So we're looking at uh, the amount of carbon uh, each component of the ecosystem is producing. And so 
this is like your gross income, the income that you make before taxes. This is what uh, gross primary production is. And um, if you look the red and the green that are on the screen, this is the production that's coming from the water and the plankton in the water. And you can see that it's higher than the gray, which is the production, the gross production coming from the sediment. And it's higher than if we remove, if you look on the other side of the graph here where I have the bottom co components, if you zoom in uh, and that chops off and takes out the plankton because you're zoomed in, you can see that the reef has even lower gross income or gross production than the sediment. Okay, so then what happens to your gross income? What happens to your gross income is that you have a tax and the tax um, in, for an ecosystem or for an organism is respiration. Respiration is when you know you're taking and giving up oxygen. That's um, or taking up oxygen. That is not going to be used. That energy is not going to be used towards growth. So this is the tax. And so let's look at the tax through time. We have June, September, July, and September for this one reef. And you can see that the tax is higher for the plankton. So the respiration in carbon in milligrams of carbon per meter squared per hour is higher this one sampling interval for the plankton. But most of the other intervals, the reef has the greatest tax. And if, again, we looked at the zoomed up components, the sediment has very little tax and the reef has a lot of tax. <laughs> so the reef's respiration is greater than the sediment and the plankton tends to have the least tax or the least amount of respiration. Okay, so then, after your taxes, this is what you net. This is your income that you take home. So this is the, the, um, the amount of productivity that the, the ecosystem um, can invest, right? So uh, if we look here, the plankton is higher. It's got the highest net productivity. And then the sediment, if we go on the other side again, we're zoomed in, then the sediment. And look at the reef here. The reef here is in red. It's not productive. <laughs> it's not going positive. It's, it's got, um, it's using all of, it's using more than it's making. So that's not good. Um, so what we think is happening in this ecosystem, we can look at the budget and the budget suggesting that the plankton is the greatest contribution to productivity. So if plankton is the greatest contribution to productivity, then it's also suggesting that the, um, the organisms on the reef, the algae on the reef, the marine plants, they aren't um, supporting that, that ecosystem, that these suggest that these reefs are attracting organisms from other areas. Um, and if we look at the, what's growing on the reefs, this tends to support our results because if we have growing on the reefs, we have things like barnacles, we have mussels, we have these encrusting organisms, and these are chunks of the reef that I'm showing you in these images. They're sea anemones. So these are all animals that catch their food uh, with in the water column. They have arms or they have um, filter feeding, and they, they suck in water and they take out all the suspended materials. And so this suggests that the plankton is the productivity source and not the algae on the reef. And just for fun, I showed you what was in the sediment. We didn't see very many macroscopic things in the sediment. That's probably why there was not much of a respiration rate. But when we did, they tend to be really cool, like these cusk eels and the brittle star and the lancelet. So that's the first story. Uh, we got some information about how artificial reef ecosystems function. And now um, I can really quickly, I think, tell you about diatoms and sea rest beds very, very quickly. So diatoms are these microscopic algae. They're found in all oceans. And they are, their bodies are made of glass. They're made of silica and they have two halves. Um, and they can be really beautiful with these spines and pores and ridges. And they can be centric like this one here, centric or pinnate. And they cover everything. You can find them on everything <laughs> in the ocean. And we know they're part of marine beds. Like we can see them on kelp, we can see them on seagrass, we can see them on this uh, coral and algal bed and on mangroves. Uh, but yet we never really get to understand how much productivity they contribute to the ecosystem because it's 
hard to separate their signal of productivity from the plant, other plant signal. We can't, when we put them in the jar, we're putting them in together and it's hard to separate them and put them into two separate jars so we can look at their oxygen rates. Uh, so I wanted to try to do that, try to get a sense of how much these diatoms contribute to a seagrass bed. And seagrasses are supposed to be one of the most, ecosystems supposed to be one of the most productive ecosystems that we have. And we know that the animals tend to, uh, that live in these, these seagrass beds, other than a few exceptions, uh, like the sea turtles and the, the manatees, a lot of the other organisms feed on the leaves and feed are feed on the things growing on the leaves, like the diatoms and the small microalgae. And so we thought that this would be a really good system if you want to understand the role of diatoms. So uh, what we did was we went to a seagrass bed. Uh, this one we went to in Alabama at Point of Pines. It's just the seagrass bed is just adjacent to the marsh. So I've highlighted it here in yellow. And we collected, we use these buckets with the um, five gallon buckets with the bottoms cut out. Um, so they're like a tube, we call that tube of core. We pushed it into the ground, we collected the seagrass and the sediment and we brought it back to the lab and we collected 16 in the sediment of those, of those gigantic buckets and we collected 16 in the seagrasses area. And we did that three times. So we're taking 32 five gallon buckets from the, from the seagrass marsh um, on three dates. So we called this Cormageddon. And then over here, you can see the seagrasses that live in the, um, this area. They were Halodule ridei and, and Rupia maritima. And so we brought them back to the lab and we arranged them so that uh, in this manner, you can see the, how they're arranged. It's not so important how they're arranged other than we gave half of them uh, an inhibitor. So this inhibitor uh, stops diatom production. So it ceases the activity of the diatoms. And the other half we didn't. And we could then incubate all the different parts to look at the change of oxygen from the beginning to end and put together a budget like we did before. And I'm cutting right to the budget, the outcome of the budget. Uh, this is the net takeaway. And if you look in red, that's when you added the bars in red on the one side of the graph, this is seagrass. And this is sediment over here. In the areas with seagrass, when you added this diatom inhibitor, the whole system went into the red. There's no, uh, no productivity. It becomes what we say heterotrophic. It, it's not producing anything. Whereas when you have the diatoms, the seagrass beds was, was producing. Um, and that wasn't the case over here in the sediment. The sediment had more variation. It was only this third time that we actually saw a contribution from the diatoms. So this is really fascinating. I don't think anyone would have ever thought that this would be the outcome. It means that diatoms are contributing uh, 71 to 83 percent to this highly productive ecosystem that uh, was generally thought that it was coming from seagrasses um, and some portion of the algae around it as well but not 71 to 83% just to diatoms. And it also shows that how important seagrasses are because when the seagrass wasn't there, the diatoms didn't have that impact. Um, and so this, this could be a, a undervalued, diatoms could be undervalued in a lot of ecosystems. And we could use this method again to try to figure out um, how much they contribute to other ecosystems in the coast. So this has been two tales about two structures, one living and not living, that organisms colonize and settle on and grow. And then that attracts other organisms to come and graze upon them. Um, but in one system, diatoms are the substantial contributor to the production. And in the other system, it's the uh, plankton. So uh, that's all I think I have time for. I could go on forever. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. And you do have some questions. <laughs> so uh, for the audience out there, we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, and then anything that we don't get to, um, Aaron, if you are amendable, I can send you those um, and get them to the, the person who's asking. So sure. we'll get started with those. So Jonathan is interested in finding out if um, algae can be utilized to um, to get mechanical in 
energy for humans. Can we use them in any way for energy production? Not that, not that I know of, no. I mean, I think you could use them for biofuels. Um, algae is being used for biofuels. Uh, that's a way we could use them for energy. Um, other than that, I don't know. <laughs> Great. Um, oh, the other Jonathan, we have two really <laughs> great Jonathan's who asked fantastic questions every week. Um, the other Jonathan would like to know um, if the sea mollusk needs mm -hmm. to continue to eat algae to maintain their photosynthetic pigment. Yes, they do. I, they need to keep to keep eating and sealing it <laughs> and putting it in its 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 back in order to, to keep it. I think it, I'm not sure how long they continually function, but it's my understanding that they need to keep Keep eating it and replacing it. Um, Tori would like to know how in the world or who in the world thought that you could make auger? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like who's who's taking the algae and grinding them up and trying these things? That some scientist, some smart scientist is doing that. <laughs> It's kind of like the brave person who tried seaweed for sushi. I mean, yeah. what, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the first person so, who tried that, Lee Muko, who uh, they had bad luck, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awful. Um, Blaine had a question. Um, so Blaine has dove in Panama City, Florida at St. Andrews State Park back in the 80s. And Blaine oh, cool. said back in the 80s, it was a white beach. Um, so the question really is, what could have, what could have caused the sand to be pink? Is that because of the increased, um, uh, increased algal population on the seafloor and rock beds? That's a that's a really interesting question. So algae do contribute a lot to sand, particularly this uh, green alga called Halamida in tropical and um, subtropical locations. And uh, it, coralline algae can also contribute to sand, and that could change the color of the beach. Um, but also um, microscopic algae that's um, growing in the sand could give it a, a color as well. Um, and I just, I don't know for that particular location what's going on, but it, it it's a plausible hypothesis that, yes, it could be um, the algae that's living in the area contributing to that. I can't imagine what it looked like as a white beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a plausible hypothesis. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we hunt. Hey, we hunt. Um, <laughs> Would like to know how plants that have air bladders, how do the bladders get air in them? Oh. <laughs> so um, marine plants, a lot of them uh, don't have an air bladder, but kelps do. And I they don't know the exact mechanism of how they get uh, it, you know, air and gases in that air bladder. It's if Something I to do with their growth and physiology. <laughs> right. If I if I remember way back when um okay. <laughs> in, in my marine botany limited knowledge, it is a uh, physiological. So yeah, it's plants produce air, right? They produce gas, and so some of that gas gets sequestered into those bladders if I remember yeah. correctly. But there's a foamy stuff in them, right? And so it's kind of a honeycomb thing filled with gas, if I remember correctly. It's not like you can pop them. Yeah, they're hard to pop. Like they're hard to get open. But yeah, it's something physiology that they produce and I don't remember the mechanism. Um. Tori also had a question about the marine communities that reside near the canopy of a kelp forest versus near the bottom. 
Um, mm -hmm. She's wondering if the changes in the community is related to the actual algae changing the surrounding environment, or is that more of a water column light? Um, it's both. I, I mean, it, it's 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 both. <laughs> Um, it's definitely light as a lot light and when um, you know things grow on the bottom they prefer this type of or acclimated to this type of understory environment but um, algae do have they change in the whole form changes like the canopy kind of you know branches out creates more refuge for hiding and the understory is kind of um, might have more space kind of to move around. So it's everything that the plant is doing is changing the environment from top to bottom and certain organisms like living in different areas. Like if you ripped up the hold fast, there's all these organisms that live in the hold fast, that thing that attaches them to the bottom. Um, at the top, there's all these organisms that live there. On the leaves, there's like a kelp snail that climbs up and down and lives on the, um, you know, body of the, the plant. So it's, it's everything, I guess I would say. <laughs> I don't know if that answered it exactly, but hopefully. Tori, if it didn't, let me know and uh, we can clarify <laughs> for you. Um, Blaine had another question about, is it possible to restore the seagrass? I think it was this, um, Blaine asked the question right around, we were talking about destruction of seabeds. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to restore those ecosystems? Yeah, so uh, there's lots of efforts going on to try to restore different uh, seagrass habitats. Uh, one thing they do in the scars is they'll put like pelican posts. You'll see those around, um, like if you go down to Perdido, they'll put pelican posts in the scar and then birds uh, land on that post and they uh, defecate. And then that those nutrients help the, the seagrass to kind of colonize back in. Uh, people will take what they call a donor bed and they'll take grasses out of a donor bed and they'll move them to a new area to try to get the grass to come back. Usually that takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and uh, there's some things are more successful than other things and if you're really trying to populate a wide area most it's my understanding that most of those restoration efforts um, aren't successful as they would like to be or it takes a really long time for them to like you've started it but now to get it to like really come back to where it was it takes a really long time um, so it's difficult it's better if we can protect the ones we have now than get into a situation where we have to restore but yes restoration is possible and people are working on techniques to improve restoration efforts great that's awesome um todd wanted me to make a comment he says your research is awesome you're doing oh. a great job. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Jonathan had a question about your academic and career path. So uh, Jonathan would like to know, did you originally start as like a terrestrial plant person? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, how did you morph into a marine botanist? I started as a swimmer. <laughs> I really liked swimming. And then uh, I wanted to dive because I like swimming and I like animals. And then I thought I was going to be an invertebrate biologist studying like snails. And so I studied, I was in a lab that studied intertidal, rocky intertidal um, animals and algae with somebody who was a marine biologist. But I said, no, or marine botanist. I said, no, I don't want to study the algae. Those are boring. I want to study the snail, this cool snail. And slowly but surely, I started paying attention to the algae and thinking they were cool. And then whenever I got into a PhD program in a marine bot or in a botany department with a marine botanist, they won me over. It's just plants are very cool, and the underwater plants they're needed and important. Yeah, so it kind of snuck up on you. Yeah, I, I fought it, and then it was like, no, just. Just study marine body. <laughs> That's interesting. I'd like to ask that question of a lot of people. You know, did it sneak up on you, or is it something you always want to do? Um, it grew on me. It grew on me like a plant. <laughs> you became encrusted. I'm sorry. That was bad. Um, <laughs> 
Kathy has a question about uh, your like light and dark experiments. And so mm -hmm. she was wondering if the lack of water flow in those containers had some impact on your results. So that is that is a good question. Sometimes you want um, you want like mixing and stirring. And so when you make like an incubation jar, the optimal one would have like mixing and, and stirring inside of it. Um, and my technique, I just don't do that, but the oxygen, so it might be an underestimation because the oxygen might help to like, um, the organisms photosynthesize a little bit more, but it sh should still be, when we compare components, like we compare the plankton to the reef, to the water, it should still all be comparable, but yeah, we would like some stirring in there. It just becomes a little more expensive and a little more difficult uh, to do, particularly if you're diving and taking like 60 jars and things <laughs> underwater, three people and a boat ride out, it's in, and wanting to make sure it seals, so sealing things is really difficult. Um, but you still get to change the oxygen and it should still be comparable, and it's just a, a, a downside of my methods. Ellie, if that didn't quite answer your question, let me know and um, I can ask for further clarification on that. Um, let's see. Uh, Aaron says, I don't have a question, but I want to cheer on the other Aaron, who also <laughs> is a marine botanist. I yeah. love the breadth and depth of this talk. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Aaron. Thanks, Aaron, for that comment. <laughs> And then, um, oh, Clayton Harpole, yay, hi Clayton, um, actually has the name of the person who developed Augur. It was Robert Koch. I think that's how you pronounce that last name. So, oh, yay, thank you for that. Hey, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Robert. Um, Ross has a question, and his question is, is there any specific species of Algae, plankton, or fish that call Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary home. Yes, Thanks. so I don't study it, but the researcher I stole the picture from, uh, she's actually uh, Suzanne Frederick. She's a Louisiana researcher. She studies the um, marine algae at the Flower Garden Banks. And I think that there are um, a lot of algae there that, uh, don't, I hope I'm not wrong. If she's watching a lot of algae there that share an affinity um, very similar to more tropical algae, which is interesting. So um, because you flower garden banks is is more offshore and cold, um, uh, deeper. I don't know. To me, it's interesting. I don't know much about flower garden banks. So I don't want to go there. But it, <laughs> it definitely she studies them, and I think there's a lot of algae there. Great. Um, that kind of transition into our last question of the evening. Um, this one's coming from Erin. I thought it was okay. appropriate since she had, <laughs> she had good things to say. We have a lot of great talks. Congratulations. Thank yous coming in. Um, so oh, I'm going to go those coming in. Um, but Erin's question, the last question of the night is, um, have you seen any indication that diatoms can overgrow seagrasses to the point where the grasses are damaged? There are some areas where, um, where if you get too many nutrients, the epiphytes, and so epiphytes are, are animals and plants that live on top of the seagrass, and there are areas where those epiphytes, um, with too much nutrients, they start to overgrow and kill the and kill the seagrass. And diatoms would be one uh, component of uh, epiphyte community. Perfect. Um, do you want a couple more? They they keep coming in. <laughs> it's up to you, Mert. I know I went a little longer maybe than I needed to. But... Um. Um. One more from Clayton. It's an interesting, or maybe two more. Uh, they're quick. Uh, so Clayton is asking, what percentage of atmospheric oxygen comes from marine flora? If you know. Uh, oh, <laughs> so I yeah, stick with my realm. I, <laughs> I would. Um, so a lot of the oxygen that we have in the atmosphere come from. Uh, 
cyanobacteria and algae like in the, the past. Um, and they contributed to the oxygen that we have now. Um, in terms of like what percentage comes from land plants versus um, marine plants, like I, I won't know. I won't know that off my head. But a lot of that oxygen was um, that we have now was we owe to algae and we owe to um, cyanobacteria, some of the first algae that um, in our evolutionary history. Perfect, thank you. And Donna's question is, who was your advisor for marine botany? Uh, so two, because my invertebrate, the guy I studied invertebrates under <laughs> was actually a marine botanist. So Steve Murray and Celia Smith. Perfect. That's right. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's really all the time. We're gonna we have to let Aaron go home sometime today. <laughs> I, Sorry, I didn't give more time. You guys can send them to me, and I'll try to answer. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I'll send you some of the the questions that um that weren't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Todd had a really interesting question about how you could possibly consume seagrass, but. I'll share that with you when we're not broadcasting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but for those of you in the audience, thank you again so much for attending another LumCon Science Talks. Remember, if you attend LUM, 10 LumCon Science Talks, you'll get a Research Vessel Pelican Challenge coin. Um, for those of you who have already earned your challenge coins, we are mailing them. It seems that it's taking a very long time for them to get from us to you. So um, uh, one person it took a month to get to. So um, hang in there, keep me posted on whether you're receiving them or not. Um, but if you want your challenge coins, you'll get an email from me.